Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health is a not-for-profit group of hospitals and medical clinics caring for surrounding communities. Their nurses, physicians, and staff are nationally recognized for their remarkable devotion to patient care. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, emotions are running high. Many people are feeling that their leaders are out of touch and the volatility in the capital markets don't seem to be as much about economic fundamentals as they are about a widespread lack of confidence. Welcome once again to CBR, the most watched source for Carolina business and public policy. This time, four economic prognosticators will analyze the Obama jobs bill and hopefully make some clarity out of where we are right now. Major funding also by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte, enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded September 9, 2011. On this week's program, Scott Beyer of Clemson University, John Sylvia of Wells Fargo, Peter Summers of High Point University, and Doug Woodward of the University of South Carolina. Now, Chris Williams. Hello, welcome to our program. Uh, this is one of my favorite programs because it's kind of a... It's like a WWF wrestling match. I mean, everybody gets kind of jumps in. Uh, Peter, welcome to the program. Scott, good to have you here for the uh, first time. You know, you got to kind of jump in with these, this gang, and that's just how it works. Uh, Peter, I'm going to start with you. Uh, Barack Obama was on television not long ago speaking about what was going on. What is going on right now? Well, he was basically speaking about what um, his administration's latest plan is to try and jumpstart the, the U.S. job market. Um, as most of you viewers probably know, the job market in the U.S. Um, in this recovery has basically been moving sideways for the past few months. Um, it's better than it was in the depths of, re of the recession, but just hasn't been creating jobs at the pace that is, is normal for, um, for this time uh, since the, end of, the formal end of the recession. And so the president's speech was about, um, as I said, his latest proposals um, to try and um, give the economy a bit of a kick. Do you, do you believe it? Is it going to work? Um, from what I've seen so far, um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I think that there were some good ideas in there. Um, as he mentioned in his speech, uh, most of those ideas have, have drawn bipartisan support in the past. Uh, whether they'll do so again now, mm -hmm. um, is that's the big question right now. Um, but um, the reactions that I've seen from uh, um, from uh, major forecasting firms are, are seem like it's it's fairly positive. They're talking about you know somewhere between an extra one percent to maybe even as much as two or three percent of GDP higher than it would be otherwise well, without without, the, it. without yeah. these. Yeah, now that, that you know, in general, economists agree on most things, but the stimulus package is the one area in which there seems to be widespread disagreement. And I think it comes down that um, you can group economists into two course groups. There's always problems doing that. But you can think of one group of economists that are on the demand side. And they think the current problem that we're going through right now is because consumers are deleveraging from all the debt they'd built up the last couple decades. And because business confidence is low and we have low investment, um, the government needs to step in and buy goods and services, create demand, boost demand, and lift employment that way. You give tax cuts, that puts money in people's pockets. They go out and spend, again, boosting economic activity. On the other side, the other group of economists think that what we need to do is focus on the supply side. Um, that is, what is going on, given the current trajectory of the government spending and where we're going with entitlements, mm -hmm. the future tax burden on on businesses and individuals is going to be sufficiently high, cutting into the return on investments. That's causing hiring to slow down, business investment to slow down. So this group of economists would rather see things focus on the supply side. 
The, the package that Obama proposed last night has a little bit to offer in both. It has the investment side, government investment, and it has some tax cuts. Do you think it can work, Scott? Um, in the sense, I think you'll get a boost from the uh, investment side, the, the government stimulus on roads, highways, and other things. And I also think it's important to get money back into the states to support fire department uh, and, and education hiring. On the tax side, which I think is more important, I would have liked to have seen, these are temporary tax proposals, I would have liked to have seen a bigger fundamental change in the structure of how taxes are done. It's I don't think firms are going to respond not to as temporary. Transitory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. temporary yeah. what, do, what do you think? Well, I'll take the demand side of this. I think that's the problem right now. I think it was smart to uh, extend the payroll tax cut. Now, it's got to be passed. We don't know if that will be, but I, I suspect that part of it will. And I think it'll boost consumer spending. You know, it was consumer spending has uh, been picking up uh, until about uh, July, uh, and it started to sputter again. So I think this is important right now to keep a, a recovery going. It's 70 percent of our economy. It's targeted towards consumer spending. Now, some of that may be used to pay down debt, but I think a lot of it will be spent. You know, it's it's money in people's pockets, and uh, I think uh, the economy will respond in a po positive way. Yeah, John. I think there are two things we'll have to watch. Uh, one. Um, how are we going to pay for this? Uh, because there's sort of like this attitude that we've proposed, but now we're going to have to wait for the super committee to decide how we're going to pay for this. And that presents a second problem, which is timing. The super committee has until Thanksgiving to do anything. So we've proposed it in September. We could be waiting until November to find out how you're going to pay for it, and then Congress gets going. Mm -hmm. And that says we might have an effective program, but it certainly isn't going to start right now. Although conceivably, um, the, the Obama package of the American Jobs Act, I think he, he called it, um, and, and he did say that they were, he was going to tell us next week how the, he proposes to pay for it. So, mm -hmm. um, but that could be done separately from the super committee um, agreement on, on additional spending cuts mm -hmm. as part of the debt ceiling deal. You, so. you know, I, and I would float this idea out that, that you all <clears throat> understand the nuances of this type of proposal a lot more than the average Joe on the street, a lot more than I would. Um, how, how do you sell it? I guess, how do you simplify the answer to say, this is not just another stimulus plan that's where we're throwing enough up on the wall to see what's going to stick, or is this just smart government spending? I mean, we've been through the partisan politics mill now for so long that people are, are not just skeptical, they're cynical. So mm -hmm. how do they know that it's not just another stimulus plan? Doug, you I'll take like one, one. Yeah, I'll take one part of that, and that's the uh, spending on, on school improvement. I think everybody mm -hmm. recognizes that needs to be done. If you haven't been in a school lately, you'll see a lot of them are not in good shape. My wife teaches in, in, a, in a portable. It leaks. I mean, we need improvements there. That's our future productivity. Uh, I think most of the public gets that. That's spending we want more of, and that can be done fairly quickly through Title I spending uh, that, that can get out and get spent and those improvements can be made and they'll affect and improve our long run competitiveness. I'll, I'll take the other side on that. Um, when I was working at the Council of Economic Advisors in Washington, we did a study on how quickly when you allocate funds to government projects, how quickly does that money go out the door? And what we estimate is for every dollar that gets allocated to an investment project within the calendar year, only 25 cents go out the door. Now, maybe this current one, you'll get more, maybe 50 cents or 60 cents, but the impact is going to be spread out more thinly. It's not going to be shovel ready. We learned last time there weren't things that are shovel, shovel ready. That's just the nature of the beast. It takes time to, to legislate, to decide which projects to go through. It takes, it's going to take some time, even though these things yeah. need to be done. It's going to bleed through 2012 and 2013. So, Chris, I would reemphasize again. Uh, we've got a that there's a lag time. There's a lag time. The and what, what's there, the danger of the lag time, John? What, what, what's what, the point? The of danger that? is that people will get frustrated. They expect quicker results than what they may probably get, and they'll get very disappointed. And once again, people will say, "Well, geez, you know, I don't see the jobs coming. I don't see the training. I don't see the school improvement. When are we ever going to get this thing done?" Peter, when mm -hmm. we talk about jobs, mm -hmm. are we talking about the right thing? I mean, jobs clearly is a political statement. But, but you know, how do we create jobs? Do we really, it's, it's sacrilegious to say, <laughs> but do we really need to create jobs? Or are we, lo are, you know, are we looking at the wrong, are we looking at this one dimensional and not m more broadly in that? Because uh, according to the media, the, the, the public can't, can't digest more than 20 or 30 seconds, whatever that it means. Well, I, I do think that, that it is appropriate to focus on jobs at, at this point. I mean, the unemployment rate in, for the U.S. is still above 9 percent. 
which is you know, historically high. Um, it has, as I said, it, it, it peaked um, toward about the middle of last year at just over 10 percent. Uh, so it's certainly improved, but uh, that's where a lot of um, people in the street are, are really kind of, that's part of their frustration with Washington, is that, you know, they, they look around, <clears throat> you know, either they're out of work or they know somebody who is. Um, that's the biggest concern for a lot of Americans. Um, they don't, they yeah. don't care about the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. but they don't care about Greece. They don't care about, about um, you know, which uh, side is, is, is right in the partisan debate. You know, they're worried about, about their jobs. So mm -hmm. I do think it is appropriate to... Uh, now, that there's a separate question of, you know, is this the right mix of policies to promote solid job creation, and that's a debate. Isn't that the question, that's a, though? A debate right. worth having, but certainly the focus. Yeah. And, and remember, part of, part of the President Obama's proposal was on housing as well, because we do have the mm -hmm. deleveraging problem for a lot of households. They have a limited ability to move, uh, take new positions mm -hmm. with their housing position, mm -hmm. but also that housing component, especially to the extent that they're underwater, really impacts consumer spending in general, and that is another problem with the overall economy. And, and you, you, you know, take Charleston, take Charlotte, take take the triangle that has the what? lowest unemployment yeah. rate. Yeah. And you talk about housing, John, and housing the, the in some markets, and not just pockets, but it seems like housing has ticked up. At yes, least it has the number of of units sold. Yeah. But the price is still falling. So yeah, the, how do you, how do you well? You know, if you look at that? the existing home sales data, about a third of those are. The foreclosures, for sales. So that so keeps that the price real, down. That keeps the price down. But we are, in terms of econ economics, clearing out inventory. Uh, in terms of mm -hmm. a lot of houses out there, they just need to be sold. They're sold at a discount. That's what's really impacting the prices. It's getting the market cleared up. Over How long time. do we clear the inventory? Well, the worst part of the market the, where there's a lot of inventory is, is the second homes, the, the coastal areas, right. and that's going to take a long time. Five I mean, years, ten years? Yeah, well, it's five years. I mean, if you've been down to the coast, you know it's just you've got a huge amount of condominiums that just aren't going to move uh, for a long time. But I think the basic single-family homes, that's going to clear. That's just starting to happen. Mm -hmm. I think that's stabilized now. Uh, we're starting to see prices stabilize and sales mm -hmm. pick up. So that's already happened. Let, let me bring you guys to, to, to another discussion here. And it has to do with the jobs thing. In, in Charlotte, there was a headline recently, and it, it was it, it was a national headline, but it impacted Charlotte the most. And the headline, I believe it was out of Bloomberg, uh, and the quote was, Brian Moynihan fights to keep Bank of America afloat, or it said B of A afloat. Um, two things about that. How did we get to a point where the darling bank of the Carolinas, certainly one of the biggest banks in this country, got to that? And, and, and then the other thing is it went on, that story went on to say, but the energy cluster has picked up and grown by X amount. So, uh, Scott, let's go with you. Let's talk about, let's talk about how we replace... <laughs> old line industries like financial mm -hmm. services. We used to say that about <laughs> right. about textiles. But how do we replace uh, financial services? Is it energy? Is it biotech? Is it what the South Carolina Research Authority is doing? Well, I, I think where you're going to see the job growth in the Carolinas is going to be in in the healthcare, in the energy sector, um, in some sense in tourism as well. Uh, the issue that we run into now, and this is why we have 9% unemployment, is it looks like some of this unemployment we have is structural. You have a mismatch of people who lost their jobs with the places that are hiring. These people need to get new skills, and it's just going to take time to transition to that. If you look at the, at the current data now, is of the 14 million people that are unemployed, 42% of those people have been unemployed for more than um, 27 weeks, and that's extremely high. In normal times, that unemployment, those people have, been, uh, have lost their job that long, is about 20% of, of, of the people unemployed. So what we have now is people whose skills are atrophying. They need to get retraining to move into these energy sectors, into the health sector. But is it, hasn't there been a study, though, Doug, that shows that the longer unemployment benefits are extended, the longer people will take advantage and they don't feel like it's the 11th hour and they have to go find a job? Well, you would think so. I mean, I think it is 11th hour, if not the 12th hour. But the question is, I, I think it goes back to what Scott's saying, the mismatch. I mean, what the, where the demand is right now, and we have a huge demand for uh, skilled 
uh, workers in the nuclear industry, and they mentioned energy before, but these workers on these extended unemployment benefits aren't going to take those jobs. They're just not qualified. So mm -hmm. that's yeah. the yeah. problem. A laid off construction worker is not going to become a doctor. No. Yeah. Right. And there, there are significant. Right. Healthcare is another one where there's growth in jobs yeah. and people just don't have the skills. There are significantly different unemployment rates by occupation and by education. And that really shows you that for a college student graduating from High Point or Clemson, uh, that's 4% unemployment. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. High school dropouts, 15, 17 percent. It's mm -hmm. a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Peter? Mm -hmm. Well, I was, I was going to say, I was going to pick up on the point you mentioned about extended unemployment benefits. Um, in, in theory, sure, that, that would um, you know, tend to prolong you know, the um, you know, job searches and everything like that. The, um, uh, the Federal Reserve, a couple of the regional banks have actually done some, some estimates of the size of that effect. And, of course, it, it's going to vary, but the biggest one that I've seen is about a bit over one percentage point. So in other words, without the, unex without the extended unemployment benefits, we might see something like 8% unemployment instead of 9 So there's still quite a lot that, that is due to other factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me say one thing so, that's happening with jobs that we haven't talked about that's um, looking pretty good, and that's manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing jobs are actually up 5% in South mm -hmm. Carolina. I'm not sure about North Carolina over the last year. So that's starting to pick up. Of course, we have the auto cluster doing very well. New announcements. Is new it expansion. focused in the automotive manufacturing area? Well, we also have aerospace now uh, right. with Boeing, right. but autos is definitely one of those. Doing is that well. NL, is yeah. that National Labor Relations Board suit? Is that is that become a uh, any kind of wet blanket on <clears throat> Boeing or any other possible ancillary supporter of the aerospace business? No, I don't think that's going to be yeah. a problem. Honestly, I think if that were ever to happen, that that they were going to allow this plant, which is already hiring workers to not open, uh, we'd see South Carolina secede from the nation again. And it's just not going to happen. We don't want to go down that road again. Right. You know, <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough, and I want, since we're talking about that NLRB suit against uh, Boeing, the North Carolina uh, uh, General Assembly has, has introduced a bill that prohibits the National Labor Relations Board from ordering any employee to relocate, shut down, or transfer employment under any circumstances. So it sounds like uh, in, in Raleigh, those legislators want to get out ahead of any type of labor pressure that the NLRB would try to do. Oh, no, absolutely. State. And I think in every state uh, is pretty much going to have the same attitude. You, you, they don't want to be told by someone in Washington whether a company can or cannot locate when, especially nowadays, everybody's fighting for those jobs. Is, um, um, what kind of marks do you give the Fed the last two years? I give them pretty good marks. I mean, you know, I think uh, they don't get as much credit as they're due. Uh, you know, they had a very tough situation, the worst, you know, as we know, since the 1930s. Uh, and just look at the effect that, uh, you know, we talk about quantitative easing um, and the monetary expansion. Look at the effect it had in the stock market. And I think that stock market coming back, once they started the quantitative easing, really restored mm -hmm. confidence in our economy. And, and I give them credit for that. And as you answer this question, be careful that the chairman's parents live in our yes. viewing area. So. <laughs> right. And I'm also employed by the Atlanta Fed. So, okay. <laughs> so, I have so to be you careful have to with my mark. I have to okay. recuse myself. Um, no, but I think actually it said that that, that first round of quantitative, quantitative easing did re release or relieve a lot of pressure um, it removed a lot of these subprime mortgages, took them off of the books of some of the banks and allowed the financial channels, the credit market channels to open up. Again, I think part of the stimulus that we saw, or part of the growth we saw in 2008, 2009, no doubt, is attributed to the actions taken by the Fed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, I think the Fed today uh, in making its decision still remains very cautious and what it needs to do, given the uncertainties in the marketplace. I think it's only after the fact where it becomes obvious what you do. Yeah, sure. While you're in the middle of this great storm, uh, the Fed's just not going to do anything big, I don't think, right now, but they're going to look at the data, like we all do, and make our judgments based upon that. You, you know, but, John and, and Peter, yeah, go ahead. can the Fed think creatively? Oh, certainly. Sure. Certainly. I think so if, if, if go, back to, did throughout. go back to before yeah. the first... QE, uh, quantitative easing round, just all the, uh, in fact, I, I told my students um, uh, last semester about everything that happened what, during what I called then uh, layman week. You know, the world was falling apart, you know, day by day, and the Fed was making this stuff up as they were going along. So I think that, you know, yes. they deserve a lot of credit for that, and, and a lot of things that had never been yeah. tried before, um, they're, you know, just basically doing everything they could think of to keep the financial system yep. functioning. Mm -hmm. I think they did a great job. 
and, and no hyperinflation like a lot of people were predicting right. and totally debasing our currency. How about, how about the stagnation that now everyone says, well, we saw it happen in Japan, it's going to happen here. Do you buy that argument? No, I don't because no. corporations are in better shape. They're not as, yeah. as leveraged up. That's what really That's hurt true. Japan. Demographics are different. And, and while, Banks and, are in slightly and, better shape yeah. than. And while we may have some structural uh, uh, unemployment now, our labor markets are much more mobile and flexible yeah. than, than, than those labor markets. Yeah. So we'll see much more transitioning people finding occupations. What, when does, and if you, you know, you can historically look at any, any, uh, any measure of corporate treasuries, balance sheets, and cash. And now it's about $2 trillion. And it hasn't been that high uh, for 50 years? I don't know. Something like, at least generationally. What is, going to, what is it going to take to get that money back at work? More visibility on the economic outlook. What do you mean? Uh, companies just remain uncertain about what is the pace of economic growth in the United States. Where are the opportunities for growth? And they are holding the cash until they get better visibility in terms of what's going on. Once they get that visibility, they're going to stop putting that money to work. It, so is it, about, is it about policy? Is it about a lack of confidence in any kind of policy? I think it's lack, no, lack of confidence in the economic outlook yeah, more I, than policy. I think it goes yeah. back to you know, what, what Scott was saying about um, the, the demand side versus the supply side. I, again, take up the demand side. I think that the biggest problem that, that businesses see at the moment is a lack of demand. Where are the customers going to come from? And so, you know, yeah. th until they see that things are, are picking up to the point where it makes sense to go ahead and start hiring new people or, or expanding their operations, you know, yeah. you see that sit on that cash? Yeah. You see yeah. that in the NFIB survey? Um, it isn't credit. It isn't regulation. It isn't taxes. It's sales. You know, mm -hmm. sales are the number one driving uncertainty. For small businesses in America, it's it's that they're not seeing current sales, or they they can't see a short-term forecast. Uh, they don't see the sales that are necessary for them to put that cash to work. We did a study recently of South Carolina firms that hired, uh, who did most of the employment expansion, and it's all about sales. When their sales are growing or doubling over the last four years, that's they're the firms that are doing all the hiring. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's only three percent. In our, of all the firms in South Carolina responsible for 66% of the net job creation, <laughs> but those are the ones that saw rapid increases in sales. We call them cheetahs. That's what we need more of. What, what type of sale or what type of industry? They're all over the place. That's really surprising. Yes, there were, and, and there wasn't any one cluster or sector. They were all in, in a lot of different industries. How, how do you, you know, let's stay with you, Doug. How, what kind of marks do you give the state's CEO when it comes to business development and uh, kind of where the state is in the economic cycle. Our governor. Yeah, yeah. your governor. Scott and I were talking about this. So we think we'd give her an incomplete <laughs> yeah, at this <laughs> point. It's a work in progress. She's made some good decisions, though, and I think the best was our Commerce Secretary, Bobby Hitt. He really knows our state. He knows it from the business side. Um, he's focused on manufacturing and, uh, and on jobs and on distribution, and they've had some success there. Mm -hmm. what, what about uh, Bev Perdue? Well, I've only been in North Carolina for a couple of months, so um, <laughs> and from what I've seen, it's uh, it seems to be it's uh, it's coming along. Mm -hmm. um, so I I don't know that I'm qualified to to give yeah. uh, Governor Purdue an actual grade. John, but, uh, well, I, I just think the uncertainties at the national level are mm -hmm. just a driving factor. It's very difficult for any governor mm -hmm. to turn things around given what we see at the national level. Right. What, what, so then, what's going to happen? And we got just a couple of minutes sure. left. When we look at the states and. You were talking, Scott, about education. We, well, we're all talking about education. How, how do we get the, tr the, infrastructure, uh, the infrastructure investment and the education investment? Where does that come from <laughs> when you can't borrow anymore and the money's just not there right now? Well, I think those are a couple of the, the most promising aspects of, of the American Job Act that, that, uh, that Obama was, was presenting um, in his speech, that you know, it, the, the states don't have it. The states are the ones that, that really need it and can, you know, arguably implement it best. So, you know, it should be coming from uh, from Washington. And, uh, and the other thing that we, that we haven't really talked about right now is, I mean, if I were doing this, I would do it slightly differently. I wouldn't be worried about borrowing the money to now to pay for that in the future. Uh, the interest rate on 10-year on Treasury bills uh, was under 2% yesterday. 
So the rest of the world is basically offering free money right. once you adjust for inflation. The dichotomy is with our with it's, our debt at the levels that they are, it's even cheaper to borrow now than it was. That's right. Uh, guys, thank you for being sure. on the program. We're out of time. And uh, we didn't get a ch chance to talk about your trip to Jackson Hole with the central bankers of the world. I bet that was Next fun. Time. And the fact that we got USC and Clemson to sit down together side by side in a, a nice manner, that's kind of a good thing. Thank you. <laughs> Doug, good to have you on the program. Thank good you to for be being here. here. Good to, it's good to see you, Scott. Peter, good to see you. Uh, thanks again, John. Until sure. next week. Uh, I'm Chris William, and we certainly hope your business is good. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte, enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health is a not-for-profit group of hospitals and medical clinics caring for surrounding communities. Their nurses, physicians, and staff are nationally recognized for their remarkable devotion to patient care. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.